Hello oh, and welcome to the show. Today is July 5th, 2022. Let me start by saying that I am not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice. This information is intended for entertainment and educational purposes only. Today is a, a short trading week due to July 4th uh, being Monday. So we only have four trading days this week. We'll be talking about stocks and the stock market and things like that. It's been a relatively quiet day, so I figured I'd do a, an understanding video. I'm, I'm calling the set of slides or, the, or this presentation Understanding the Game, Short Attacks. And we'll be going over some of my own personal rules that I keep for myself there to keep my own sanity. Specifically, we'll be going over rule number five, rule number one, and rule number two. And uh, we'll have some examples of uh, GameStop and uh, Metamaterials, Torchlight, Preferred Share, to Stock Symbol, GME, and MMTLP. So let me uh, start by going over some rules. Uh, these are some rules that I keep for myself in order to keep my own sanity in the stock market. Uh, these are just the first five rules. I have about 13 rules that I uh, have previously disclosed in some previous videos. I can provide some links to what those videos are if, you, if you're interested in them. These are, these are the first five rules, okay? All the rules are important. <laughs> in any case, rule number one is never invest more than you can afford to lose. Which, to me, that means don't use margin because there's an old saying that markets can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent, okay? Basically, what that also means is that whatever your investments are, so to me, what that means, whatever your investments are, you need to be comfortable enough with them that you can sleep at night, right? Because if you can't sleep at night, you got zero chance to make any rational decision in the morning or in the rest of the day. Rule number two, know your, know your investments, or better yet, know why you're investing in a particular vent venture. For me, that means you, should, you need to be able to explain your investment to anybody in, in five minutes or less, probably a minute or so, right? You need to, have a, you, you need to be able to understand why you're investing in something, okay? Rule number three, know your risk and suppose you're wrong, okay? That's pretty obvious. I.e., know how much you can afford to lose. It ties in with rule number one, and etc. Rule number four, understand your upside and downside potential. You know, what are some reasonable targets and what's some time frames, you know, for those targets. Rule number five is the one we'll be focusing on for now. Every buyer has a seller. Understand who is or maybe on the other side of your investment and why did they do the opposite, okay? Why did they do the opposite? It's, uh, it's a very, uh, it's a rule I like to keep for myself. Now, we'll be looking at a speci specific case of this rule, and the specific case is, suppose the other side of your investment is a short seller, okay? You may ask yourself, what is a short seller? <laughs> to, to answer that question, you have to answer, what's a long, right? A long is tr traditionally someone who buys low and sells high, right? They buy at a low price and sell their stock at a higher price. Most people are long, right? Longs are generally what make up the market. So longs are owners of the stock that they sell, right? So when you're buying from a long, you're buying from someone who already owns the stock. So what's a short? Shorts sell high and they buy low. What? How do you do that? <laughs> Shorts sell stock that they don't own, so they incur a debt of stock, and they get some cash up front because they've sold that stock, right? And they hope to buy back that stock because they've incurred a debt of that stock and extinguish that debt at a lower price in the future, right? As a result, shorts don't own the stock that they're selling. They have to borrow, borrow it from someone else, right? Or they're naked, right? They've got unsecured debt. And uh, people who can be naked shorts are people like market makers, things like that, right? They have special superpowers. In either case, shorts generally have to maintain a cash position that's large enough if they ever need to buy back the stock at any given time, right? That's called a margin requirement. So shorts have this margin requirement, and they need to maintain that cash position, right? So when they, um, when they sell the stock that they don't have and they get cash for it immediately... If the price doesn't go down, they need to maintain enough. They need to maintain that cash. And if the price goes up, they need to put up more cash. Right? Now, let me start by saying not all short... Suppose 
Well, the other side of your trade is a short hedge fund, not just a short individual, but a short hedge fund, right? Hedge fund is a is a larger entity, right? They 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 have a lot more money, and uh, not all short hedge funds are bad necessarily, right? A lot of them, you know, they were set up to genuinely identify, you know, an expo an exposed mismanagement of companies or bad management. You know, examples of that are like Enron. Um, but other short hedge funds, you know, they just attempt to drive the company stock towards zero, and they they profit from destroying the company, right? That that's what they do. Now you don't know what kind of short hedge fund it is, but you know that's 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 the possibilities, right? So they're not all bad. Some are good, but some are also bad, right? A lot of them are bad. Now shorts have a particular have a particular uh, particular risk that longs do not have, in that uh, shorts can lose a lot more than they actually initially invest. Okay. So, suppose you short a stock and you expect the price to go down, but instead the price goes up. Well, the price can go up and up and up towards infinity. The most you can make by shorting a stock is 100%, right, of, of, of what you initially have gotten. But uh, the downside risk is you can lose an infinite amount. The price of the stock can keep going up and up and up. So you can lose a lot more than, uh, than you initially thought you might gain. So, uh, so if a stock takes off and you're short, it can become much more expensive than what you initially sold the price at, right? So you have to buy back that share, and uh, the cost to buy it back can be a lot more than whatever dollars you received when you initially sold it. And uh, that means that you're going to have increased margin requirements as the stock price goes up. And that's going to and uh, you know those initial margin requirements means that you'll have to put up extra money. And if you can't put up the extra money, you might wind up closing the position. Now, that's a downside that, uh, you know, that may cause something called a short squeeze. If enough shorts have to put up, you know, uh, enough cash and they don't have the cash to put up and the price of the stock goes up, that's called short squeeze. But there's also this other thing called a gamma squeeze. And a gamma squeeze works from the options market, right? The way it works is, that suppose you write something called an out-of-the-money call option. And the way a call option works is a call option gives the buyer of the call option the right to buy shares of a stock at a fixed price, at a particular price, for a particular, for a particular short period of time, right? An out-of-the-money call option, that mean, basically means that, you're gonna ex that the exercise price for that option is above whatever the current price is, right? That's why it's out of the money. That means that the option has zero intrinsic value. Right, because it's cheaper to buy the stock outright than to exercise the option. Right, the option has no value. Now, most, uh, you know, most out of the money options they ex actually expire worthless. Yeah, and option writers typically make a lot of money on these premiums that they charge. Right, so you buy an out of the money call option from an option writer, and the option writer makes a ton of money because the they expect the 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 option to expire worthless. Now, if you write a call option, you can make a lot of money that way, right? But sometimes the price of the stock gets above the exercise price, and the option writer is on the hook to deliver those shares. Now, it's fine if they actually own those shares, right? But sometimes op those option writers don't own the shares. That's called a naked. That's called a naked call. You know, if they own the shares, it's called uh, it's called a covered call. But if they don't own the shares, then that naked call writer, you know, he's on the hook for a larger amount of money because he's got to go out and buy the shares and who knows how high the price would go. So to limit his risk of, uh, of, of spending a ton of money if the price goes towards infinity, he's going to start buying, he's going to start buying shares as the, as the price of the shares heads towards that exercise price, right? So he's going to hedge or limit his risk. And uh, when the price of the shares starts heading towards that exercise price, and the option writer starts hedging his risk by buying up shares, he may initiate what's called a gamma squeeze. Uh, or essentially, that's what a gamma squeeze happens, right? The price starts heading upwards, and the option writers have to now buy shares. Now, sometimes there are more options that have been written than shares actually exist. And uh, that can be very, very dangerous. Okay. Anyway... Uh, a gamma squeeze is what happens when the options market affects the underlying stock due to options head hedging. Right. So <clears throat> now, 
we've got short squeezes, we've got gamma squeezes now. One short squeeze may cause others shorts to get margin called, right? And as a result, you may have a large, a large number of shorts that are, that are now, you know, squeezed. And as a result, the stock price goes up significantly. And w and combine that with the gamma squeeze, you have a long in, a large influx of long buyers, right, that are driving up the price significantly at that at that point. And this whole thing can get out of control very very quickly, right? Now, so what happens? during the time that a hedge fund is actually shorted your stock. Well, when a hedge fund actively shorts your stock, that selling, that initial selling pressure, right, that pushes the price of the stock down. And the game plan for the shorts is, of course, to push the price of the down, of the, is to push down the price of the stock towards zero, uh, and possibly even if they're lucky, get the stock delisted. That's the final goal of the, of the, of the short hedge fund, right? They want the stock to get delisted. Uh, and if that happens, they never have to close their position, right? They can leave that position open forever. They can leave that short position open. And, they, and if their position is never closed, they don't have to pay any taxes on it because their gains aren't fully, aren't fully realized yet. Meanwhile, they've got the cash, right? And, uh, but sometimes if more sh stock is shorted than exists and they ever need to close that position, it may become impossible for shorts to close that position, right? So uh, shorts have this risk, and they they need to keep keep track of that, right? So what happens to you if you're along and you've bought the stock, right? Well, that means that you should be prepared if the stock could drop by fifty percent, seventy five percent, eighty percent, ninety percent, because the shorts are actively shorting your stock. And that brings me back to rule number one, right? Never invest more than you can afford to lose. Never use margin, right? The shorts are not going to close their position. They're going to they're going to increase their short position. They're going to try to push the price of stock down. Meanwhile, you're long, and um, you know you're seeing the price of your stock go down a lot. So anyway, so rule number one again: don't invest more than you can afford to lose. Don't use margin, right? And the markets can remain irrational longer. Then you can, then you or I can remain solvent. That's just the way things are, right? So, what does that mean? For in in an example, right? So, so suppose you're a short hedge fund. So you've got a lot of money. So let's say that you're going to short, um, you know, you're going to short a, short a stock by a fair amount. And, um, oh, I'm sorry. So suppose you're a hedge fund and you're going to short a stock by a large amount, right? You're going to short it like a million dollars. And you want to drive the price down by, say, 75% or more. And let's say that, you know, you've shorted a million dollars worth of stock. And you've driven the price down 75%. Now, that means if you wanted to close your position, you could get, you could buy back the stock at, at a quarter of the price, right? Uh, you know, for $250,000 and secure $750,000 $750,000 worth of profit. Now, you got to pay tax on that, so you might drop that down to 375 k Who knows? It depends on your tax bracket. But yeah, you got about 750 k worth of profit, maybe 375 after taxes, right? But you could try shorting again with another million dollars and drop the price even down further, right? You know, keep the position open, avoid paying the tax on the profit. Now you got more money, right? You got... So then... Let's say that you're a short hedge fund, right? And you and you do that, right? And so you've got two. So let's say you you you've got a total investment of two million dollars. You got a million dollar initial investment, right? And um, you got a million dollars additional now because you shorted after the price has dropped seventy five percent. Now you're at twenty five percent of the original price, right? Now you've got a liability on the other hand, right? So suppose so you have to provide those shares back in case the price ever goes back. So, so suppose the price got back to its original price, right? Well, that original $1 million is a break-even. You don't make or lose money on that because you got the $1 million to buy back the same number of shares that you did, right? Now, what about that second million that you shorted at, you know, when the price was down by 75%, when it was only a quarter of its, of its current price? Well, that stock is now worth $4 million. And that's a debt of $4 million that you own, right? 
So basically, that means that your $2 million investment results in a loss of about $4 million. So you can lose more by shorting if the price goes up or even if the price recovers to where it's gotten to if you do additional shorting, right? So uh, it's, it's a tough game to shorts, right? Now, none of this includes, you know, the short borrow fees, of course, and short borrow fees can be astronomical. I'm not going to get into short borrow fees right now. Anyway, so, uh, so this could be a reason why shorts haven't closed their position, right? If you think about it, right? Suppose, on the other hand, you're a long, okay? And suppose you buy after the stock price drops 75%. So let's say you bought, you have a total investment of $2,000, right? You bought $1,000 worth of stock initially. That established your position, right? It's a long position. And then the price drops by 75%. It's at a quarter of the original stock price, you you know, that that you were originally bought at. You're, you're not feeling good because, you know, you lo you've got a paper loss of about, you know, $750, say. But you spend $1,000 again and you buy the stock at a 75% discount to where, the, your you know, your original price was, right? So... You're now at 25% of the original price, and you've bought $1,000 worth of stock. And suppose that stock recovers back to the original price. What happens? Well, the original $1,000, that's a break-even, right? Because you bought it at $1,000. You bought it at a particular price, got back to the original price. It's a break-even. It's a wash. It's still worth $1,000. It's not worth any more. It's not worth any less. But that stock that you bought, that additional $1,000 worth of stock that you bought at a at a 75% discount, you know, that's worth $4,000, right? So your $2,000 investment is now worth $5,000, right? That's a 2.5x gain, or about plus 150%. That's not bad. Suppose it recovers to twice the original price, okay? That means that original $1,000 that you, that you spent is worth $2,000, and the additional $1,000 that you bought when it was down 75%, that's worth $8,000, that means your $2,000 investment is now worth $10,000. That's a 5x gain, or plus 400%. That's pretty darn good. See, This is why I say you need to know your investment. Know why you're investing. Know what, you know, know what, that, ven the, know what that venture is, right? You really, need, you really need to understand and know your investment. You need to be strong and confident, right? So short attacks operate, you know, because of their very nature... They operate very different from a slow, steady appreciation of a stock, right? With a short attack, you see the price action is down mostly. And sometimes it's violently down, but it's generally down. And at some point, when that short attack fails or if it breaks, there can be a violent upward movement in price. And it can happen repeatedly, right? Let's take an example. Let's look at GameStop. At GameStop around 2019, the price of the stock at, at some point early on in 2019 was about $16. So if you bought the stock at $16, you know, you would see the price of that stock drop significantly all the way down to $3.30. Say That's a 75% drop just by itself, right? A 75% drop is, would bring it down to $4. $3.30 is worse than 75%. And, uh, and you'll see things like, you know, violent, downward price movements, as I indicated here. They dropped sharply down, right? It's pretty intense. You lost, you know, you might panic sell at that point, but that, that's typically what you see. At the end of the year, at, at by September of 2020, you had some price recovery. got to $8 from $16, so, you know, it came back a little bit, but, you know, generally the price was down, okay? But what happened by April of 2021, okay? By April of 2021, the stock price went up violently. It got up to $480 peak. <laughs> if you bought at $16 a share and it got to $480, even if it dropped down to $3.30, you're in pretty good shape. If you bought at $3.30 a share, you're in, you're in fabulous shape. <laughs> if it's gotten to, three, to $480 per share, right? even, at, even if you bought at $8 a share, you're in pretty good shape. But this is what happens when, you know, when, when shorts fail, right? And let's look at games. This is just September. I mean, this. I'm sorry. This is just April of 2021. This is just by April. We, you know, we saw it, it. It get to some huge prices. Where is the price today? Well, it's still 120 dollars. You'd still be doing fabulously, even if you held on to that stock by then, right? So, 
I believe the shorts are trapped today, right? There's no easy exit possible for these shorts, and that's just that's just the case, right? We we know companies like Melvin Capital that close their doors and they have massive losses along the way, you know, massive massive losses. We even know recently that the DTCC released information that in January to February of 2021 there were 9.7 billion dollars in fines that were waived. These were waived, basically. If those fines had happened, there would be the price would have gone up even further significantly. Right? There was no written policy for waivers. This was just massive corruption, right? And um, yeah, these fines were waived, and uh, you know a lot of the shorts, you know they, you know they got away with stuff. They're still underwater. They're still in massive problems, but you know the game's not over yet. I mean, those fines were waived, but but you know shorts are in deep trouble. Let's see what, um, you know, this is what, um, uh, what is it? This is what um, Thomas Peter Fry had to say about it in, uh, you know, uh, during the hearings. Let's hear. Uh, sorry, the loans repay their margin loans and exercise the calls, their brokers would have had to be, would have been obligated by the rules as they are today to deliver to them 270 million shares while they on, by only 50 million shares existed. So when the shorts cannot deliver the shares, the broker representing the longs must, must, by the rules of the system, go into the market and buy the shares at any price, pushing the price into the thousands. So as the price is higher, the shorts default on the brokers. The brokers now must cover themselves. They push the price further up. So the brokers default on the clearing houses, and you end up with a complete mess that is practically impossible to sort out. So that's what almost happened. To avoid this in the future. That's what almost happened. <laughs> so, but the GameStop story is not over yet. Let's move on now. Let's talk about Torchlight Energy and then Materials, right? They had a merger in, around uh, June 24th, 25th time frame. Torchlight Energy is an oil and gas exploration company. And when they merged, uh, there was this thing called a Series A preferred stock that was going to go to the Torchlight Energy shareholders, okay? Torchlight Energy shareholders would get a Series A preferred shares that were non-tradable, and they'd get MMAT shares, right? Metamaterials. And um, Metamaterials shares would get two shares of Metamaterials, and Torchlight Energy shares would get one share of Metamaterials and one share of Torchlight Energy. So these Series A preferred shareholders, they would receive proceeds from the sale of Torchlight Energy's oil and gas assets, which is basically about 134,000 acres in Texas, that contain about 3.2 billion barrels of oil. Just think about that. 3.2 billion, billion barrels of oil. And during that time of the merger, oil, oil was around 73, 74 bucks a barrel or so. Okay. Um, prior to that time in the merger, we have, uh, we have George Palacaris. He was talking about what the possible dividend would be. All of this was disclosed. And he was talking about he was talking about around a dollar to twenty dollars a share. Let's hear what he has to say. Um, you know, the price of oil from one twelve month period went from negative to being, you know, let's say uh, in a good uh, momentum. Yeah. So the more time that goes by over the next six months, I can tell you that uh, Torchlight Management is speaking to the right potential buyers that they're top tier and frankly nobody can predict if this is going to be a a one dollar or a twenty dollar dividend that it's very difficult because buyers have their own different motivations and they'll think about the price differently depending on where we are in the market you have seen that in the United States, uh, the new president Biden has done some additional restrictions in the oil and gas industry. Yeah. And that makes an asset 
for the assets that the Torchlight has even more valuable. So. Okay, so uh, at that time, the price of oil was around $63, $64 a barrel at the time that this, um, that this uh, interview took place. This was an Italian interview that was recorded. Links will, will be provided. Um, anyway, that was around May 13, 2021. 20, and um, if we look back at that time, if we look back even you know at a one-year average, one-year moving average, the price was around, say, $67 uh, you know, $64 a share or so, $63, $64 a share on that day. But uh, it was close to around $50 in, if you look at the one-year average price, because the price was a lot lower earlier in the year, right? So it was under $50 at that time. Where's the price of, you know, so, uh, you know, that's that's where the price of, of, of oil was back then. Where's the price of oil today? It's a lot higher, I'll tell you that much. Anyway, so uh, what happened was that Torchlight Energy, uh, they stopped trading on 625-2021. Uh, were there a bunch of short strap then? Probably. Possibly. We think so. <laughs> uh, earlier, were there a bunch of, sh of Torchlight Energy shorts from the previous price run-up that were trapped? Probably during the first price run-up around February time frame. There's probably a lot of shorts there that were trapped. Um and uh, just prior to the price run-up, there's probably a lot of shorts there that were trapped as well. Who knows? It's hard to say. But there's a, there's speculation that there's a lot of, of shorts that are just basically trapped, right? Now, Torchlight Energy, those Series A preferred shares, when they became you know, distributed, they were non-tradable. The shorts were trapped because they can't get the Series A preferred shares to actually provide to you know whoever they owe them to. And... Um, but something strange happened on October 7th, 2021. There was a symbol ca that came out called MMTLP and it began trading. And the broker dealers indicated that MMTLP is the Series A preferred shares. And so those those Series A preferred shares that were in client accounts, th that symbol changed to MMTLP. And uh, this is what John Berta has to say about it on an interview that took place on Twitter. Uh, and links will be provided to that to a replay of that interview, but let's hear. What MMTLP say. would have never happened had the books been really balanced on the dividend day. So the brokerage houses, the prime brokers, and these hedge funds never cleared their position. And so, now they're kind of stuck, right? Yep. And so they've, uh, you know, they they started trading this so they could get, you know, people to sell their preferred positions that were in their brokerage account so they could clear out their trade. Exactly. Because so. the sooner you the sooner you get rid of it, they can account for it. That's right. So and, and it's now, still not here, over. let's I, can, can we I still don't think it's over, to be honest with you. <laughs> oh no, I don't think it is. Now I, I do want to know if we can clear this one thing up. Um since we've got you on the line and you're as official as it gets. Um and I think this has been made public. If you can't if you can't answer it, just say no, you can't answer it. Everything was transferable. You just said that. That means anybody who holds the new shares of MMTLP means that get transferred too, right? They get their yeah. dividend. Yeah, they get their dividend. Yep. Thank Yay! you very much. I, I needed to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome, Bird. <laughs> there you go. If you got MMTLP, you got uh, you know you'll get your dividend. Now let's look at the price of MMTLP. It's been remarkably stable during all that time. At a or, you know, it's cur currently closed around a buck fifty-five or so, but it's it's been remarkably stable. In fact, it's been even more stable than the S and P five hundred. <laughs> MMTLP is up. If if you look at it since uh, since what is it since uh, October time fr you know since mid October time frame or so, you'll see that uh, it's up by about uh, twenty five percent compared to the S and P five hundred, which is down fifteen and a half percent. You know. Since at that time so hey there you go but um the reason that it's remarkably stable is that if the price you know if the price gets too high then people might start buying mmtlp and the shorts actually they want to buy that M those mmtlp shares from you and cover their position now they want to get you to sell those mmtlp positions so they can't let the price go up uh, go too high and that means that they have to short attack 
MMTLP shares. They'll have to naked short attack them because they don't actually have the shares. So, but they'll have to deliver those shares. Every single time those naked short attacks happen on MMTLP, they will have to deliver. That's additional shares they'll have to buy, right? Let's look at the price of oil since the time of that George Pellick Harris interview, by the way, right? Right now, the price of oil is $97.61 a barrel. Uh, a, the one-year average for the price of oil is around $87.81 a barrel. At the time of the George Pellick Harris interview or so, uh, it was around $63, $64 a barrel. The one-year average back then was under $50 a barrel. Price of oil has gone up significantly, and uh, the value of those shares has also likely gone up significantly since then. So that's why I say know your, your investment or know better yet why you're investing in a particular uh, venture, right? A while back, I made this chart about uh, what I, what I <clears throat> about what I project the dividends of MM, MMTLP to be, uh, and it's uh, based upon the price of oil, right? Uh, if you want to learn how this chart is made, I will, you know, there will be a link provided at the end of this uh, in the description of this video, and you can click on that, and it'll go over that uh, the process of making this chart in detail. Okay. Basically, we're in this range of that chart right now, right? We're somewhere around. The price, the one-year average price of oil being eighty-seven dollars eighty cents. The current price is around almost a hundred dollars or so. That means we can be expecting anywhere from fifty-five to sixty-five dollars uh, sh uh, per share of dividend value, based just on the three point two billion barrels of oil, and that's assuming the natural gas that's there has zero dollar value, and uh, that's an intrinsic price. That's not a squeeze price. That's an intrinsic price. So what's the plan for MMTLP? We know that there's been progress made on MMTLP since the time I mentioned all that. By December 13th of 2021, there were four additional test wells or four additional wells that were made. Uh, drilled at a cost of about $14.2 million per, uh, $14.2 million total. And the plan for MMTLP is to spin out Oilco, which is, we now know Oilco is going to be next, which, and retire those, those MMTLP shares. We're going to do some limited production, convert the designation of those reserved estimates to proved. That'll increase the price of the Oro Grande project significantly. Maybe we'll drill some more wells during the time. Then we'll sell the torchlight oil and gas assets, right? That's the Oro Grande project for maximum value, according to George Palacaris. Pay out that dividend to MMTLP, slash oil co-shareholders, slash Nextbridge shareholders, because it's probably going to be Nextbridge. And that's where we're headed. Okay? And um, we even know that we've got $5 million now that's been allocated for this. Okay. And uh, that's in terms of the oil and gas assets. And so the next step is to actually do the spin-out process. Uh, the, S, um, the S1 has actually not been filed. It will be filed with the SEC. Uh, MMTLP that MMTLP dividend will result in a dividend of oil co-shares slash uh, Nextbridge shares. Uh, and those shares will only be available from metamaterials. And the shorts must deliver those oil co slash Nextbridge shares. And they need to deliver to the longs. And we know that they can't do it, so that means that they'll be trapped. That also means that they will be uh, that they need to close their positions. The only way they could possibly close their positions is to close their positions before the, you know, before the the MMTLP stops trading, before that last day of trading. They need to buy up all the MMTLP shares they can and close their position, right? That means there's a possibility that the price could go astronomical as they're buying up all of these shares, right? On the very last day of trading, the shorts and the broker dealers for the shorts must deliver those oil co next bridge shares to the longs. And when that happens, who knows where the price may go, okay? I'm not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice. This information is intended for entertainment and educational purposes only. And um, as a result, um, this is, you know, this is a possibility for MMTLP, okay? And that concludes my video. Uh, this is, uh, it is uh, July 5th, 2022. And um, that's talking a little bit about uh, understanding the rules of the, understanding the, you know, my rules and under, understanding how the game works, right? And this is how things operate under a short attack. With that, goodbye.